And, and to come to that point, really, you feel like it's rock bottom. You know, it's really like, it's a pretty shit place to be. And when he came back, he gave me 900 bucks. I said, okay, here's uh, 200, pay the phone bill. Here's 200, pay the electricity. Here's 300 for you, Zay, you keep it. I don't know where I'm gonna pay you, I'm gonna pay you. And with this last 200, we're going to Subang for buffet. <laughs> and we went straight to Subang. And we sat there and we just wanked the buffet, I tell you. Right? I, I, I remember clearly. So things can get pretty bad. I mean, if things do get pretty bad, always go for a buffet. <laughs> So, so after all that, you know, things started to improve. We worked hard. We got out of our rut. We did. We, we sold. We we sold the the studio, the uh, the editing studio. And I said, look, we like music. Let's convert to a music studio. So we converted to a music studio. And we started doing things, and we got out of our rut slowly. And I think it was only at Rock Level Four, uh, where uh, 2003, where we got back into the black. I remember that day very clearly because we paid back Vinny. And he was a little, we wrote it all down on the board, all, everybody we owed money to. So we crossed them one by one, one by one, one by one. Every time we had a bit of money, we paid them back. We paid our rent, paid things. And we finally paid them back. We had no business model to speak of, yeah? We were just doing odd jobs here and there. Uh, part of the things we were doing was events. But we were getting good at events. We were getting better. Rock Level 3, Rock Level 4, Rock Level 5. We then launched Pesta Malam Indonesia, which is the biggest Indonesian concert here. I mean, we were paid like, a bomb. We paid over a million ringgit in sponsorship for that. And eventually we build Fat Boys up to be... Fat Boys right now does about 5 million, 6 million revenue per year. And we have two warehouses, we have a mobile stage, we have 50 speakers, we have 14 full-time staff, mostly Boo Boo <laughs> and, um, and And we got out of that rut, so we built ourselves out of that. And this is the company that I was a CEO of. I was a CEO, nobody hears about this one. They're like, oh, now you're a CEO. I was like, you know, I was a CEO before doing this. It was just as tough and just as hard as it is running a telco, which has a much bigger market, uh, uh, pay of capital, uh, bigger shareholders. It's just as hard running a small SME than it is a big business. The quantum is different, and you might not have to deal with asshole bankers, but you still have to, sorry, are any bankers in the room? <laughs> because you're here, you're not an asshole. <laughs> So, <laughs> forgive me, I'm just kidding around. So it, it, it's, it's, it's pretty much the same. And I always believe take any, every opportunity you can. When I joined HITS, right, I was getting up at 5 a.m. to drive all the way out to flip in some embassy every single morning. Can you imagine that? Okay, some of you may, may do that, but every single morning, you know, your life doesn't, your life ends at 7 p.m. You're like, oh, I gotta go to bed, you know? <laughs> you can't do it, you can't join your friend's birthdays or have late night drinks, or anything like that. So it was during this time where I was promoting, I think, Rock the Wolf 4. I was in, uh, uh, I was in ATV, and Nizam Omar grabs me aside and says, hey, we want to do a talk show. We think it'd be great for a talk show. I was like, yeah, let's do a talk show, blah, blah, blah. Let's, uh, it's at midnight. I was like, ooh, okay, let's do it, let's do it. So we were doing Latte at 8, and you know, it was two nights a week at that time. And it was, I think it was at 1, it was at 12.30. 11. That time, 11? 11. No, it was 12, we finished at 1, the first round. So it was, it, now get this, I go to Latte, 12 o'clock, finish at one, sign autographs and all that. I'm really out of there by two, back home, in bed, maybe I'll get to sleep by three. Alarm clock goes at five, so I got two hours, and I get up and I go straight to, to, to Astro, and I got a sound awake, today's hit music, the all new hits, and hey, how you guys doing, hey, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was bad. It got so bad that I'd be like, hey, yeah, really good, again. <laughs> and I'd be asleep. And it got bad, you know, Ralph Marshall once was taking around the investors, and he's like, here's our glorious two move. <laughs> ping, 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 ping. And I'd be like, and Rudy's like, chill, 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 get up. I'm like, I get up, you know, and I'd have that stream of slime. Like, What's up, man? And then i turn around, and there's all these investors, you know. <laughs> and I was like, hi. <laughs> yeah. So... You know, it was it was tough. It was tough, but but I relished it. I, I liked the work. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed meeting people. I enjoyed I enjoyed the platforms. I always believe you have to create platforms uh, and 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 entice open doors, open opportunities. So I did latte. Uh, I was enjoying myself, and then and Fat Boys was doing well. And then one day, I, yeah, I did call Kyrie and I say, Hey, I've got this idea for a, a football reality show, and we did my team. 
And my team was, you know, we went and got all these kampong boys, you know, from all over Malaysia. They were really kampong boys, man. I mean, I'd never experienced kampong kampong. When people say kampong, you know, they're talking about kampong or whatever, or even some nice kampong in, you know, Sunan Pichala or, 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 or Sunan Besar. Some of these were really kampong kampong, man. I mean, you don't even know where the kampong is. You're driving on a road to nowhere. And then you see beach and sand, you're like, where's the kampong? And then it's like in some mangrove swamp, you know? And it really is tough. Some of these kids have it really tough, you know? And it really, I learned about the poverty of poverty of Malaysia, you know. These kids never been on an airplane before. When we took the, the team, we took them to Manchester United on on the flight, and we were all on this flight. And half of these kids never been on a plane before. And the ones, well, the ones who were singing, they were holding hands, and they were like, "Let me down, let me down, come on, come on, come on, take it, take it now, you know." The plane would fly, and then they'd get out in in, in UK and be like, "Whoa, an icon, isn't it? Whoa!" You know? They really never experienced it, you know. And then they played against Manchester United, uh, Man U, Manchester United reserves. We drew nil nil. We came back to Malaysia. There was a lot of controversy because we were challenging FAM and all that sort of thing. But we did score the first goal, and it was scored by a room service boy named Alun Kuh. <laughs> and when that ball went in, it just showed us one day. It showed us that it was possible. And then dreams were really becoming reality. We we're like, wow. We lost two one, but it was still a fantastic match. And we managed to franchise uh, um, franchise uh, my team in Indonesia as well. And we did my team season two. It was pretty cool. It was it was very enjoyable. Throughout my music career, I always did look for look to help, look for people to play help. Don't be afraid to ask people for help. You know, if you're starting out business or whatever, always ask for help from anyone, because everyone has a story they can tell you. Even if you meet someone who you think is useless, can I talk to you about blah, blah, blah. They might talk the whole day for four hours about nothing, but somewhere in there they'll say something that will just catch your ear and be like, hey, no. it might be an idea, it might be some help, it could be anything. One of these people, people was Tony Fernandez, and I asked for help. I said, "Can you help me, um, you know, push my music?" So Tony was always helping me. He was helping. He was like, "Yeah, don't worry, I'll get you a meeting with East West Records or in, or, or Virgin or V2 in the UK." So I would be in the UK, you know, meeting people, and Tony always helped me do that. And we'd always run into each other, you know. Like, I remember him first telling me, uh, in, in I think in 2000, he said, "I'm going to start an airline, leaving the business. What do you think?" I was like, "People seem to. I seem to get a lot of people ask me what I think." Izan did the same thing. Izan, before he left, uh, he left EMI and he joined the um, ATV, he said, Jello, what do you think about me going into TV? And I was like, I don't know, I'm good. <laughs> and Tony also was, 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 you know, before he set up his airline, he was like, what do you think about, about, about the airline business? I was like, I don't know. Knowing what I know now, I should have said, Tony, I'll, I'll, I'll support you, I'll, I'll invest in you. <laughs> Because you know Tony has a friend, Mark Lancaster, who's now the CEO of Tune Hotels. It's a running joke in uh, the Tune Group. Because when Tony left uh, Warner, he asked Mark to join him, and Mark's like, I don't know, Tony. You know, um, Warner's pretty stable for me right now. You know, the wife. You know, the, you know, got a future thing. And Tony's like, okay, fine. And you know, of course, AirAsia when it became a multi-billion-dollar company. <laughs> and then he asked Mark, Hey, I'm I'm, I'm doing a hotel. Do you want to? Yeah, I'll join you. <laughs> So Mark is the CEO of Tune Hotels, which in itself is probably a billion dollar company right now. It's doing very well. So one day I was I was out and we were you know we were sitting. I worked with Tony very closely uh, for my team, you know, because uh, AirAsia was you know we were we were taking the Red Devil over to the UK and, and we were working together quite a lot. And Tony knows about my exploits. I mean we, we were doing we were doing events and things like that. So we, we also play futsal. Tony's the worst futsal player. We call him the hacker. <laughs> Um, you get injured, you play with, like, play with him, and you don't move out of the way. So when I get the ball, I always pass it, because I run. Because he'll just, Rrr. I think he plays football probably the way he does business. In Patrick Ram mode. So uh, one day he was sitting down, and uh, I heard him talking with Zafro at the time. Zafro was uh, in the group, he was uh, CEO of uh, Tune Money. And he was telling Zafro, I need a, I need a CEO for, for Tune Talk, for the mobile business. And I chatted with Tony previously, because I've always had an interest in mobile. Because I thought, I'm tired of begging these guys for money, you know. So I would always be talking about begging. I used to beg. I go to TN and beg. I say, please sponsor our Rock the World concert. Please sponsor Best Time. I even had like I was in a boardroom once. I remember this time Dr. Adnan was there, and um, he was the head of the team. And, and he came in and he said, "What is this Rock the World? Hey, I've never heard of Rock the World." <laughs> I said, "Forgive me, Dr. Uh, how many people in this room are below the age of 40?" And, uh, Nobody raised a hand. Thirty-five. <laughs> yeah. 